through Since when has impossible ever stopped you Friday's disappointment and Sunday's empty too Since when has impossible ever stopped you This is the sound of dry bones rattling This is the place that makes a dead man walk again Hope in the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling Fire, Come on. stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Yeah, resurrection power runs in my veins too. Promise you 
presence of Jesus, the keeper of peace. And peace is a promise he keeps. Hey, whether you're here in the building or joining us online at home, we're so glad that you guys are here. You guys chose to be here with us, and and man, we love that, right? The Lord's in this place. I'll tell you that much, right? You can can feel him. You know he's here, right? And so, hey, we got a lot to be thankful for. In the midst of 2020, in the midst of tough times, we have so many things to be thankful for. And just as a reminder, next week, Thursday night, Thanksgiving, we will not be here, okay? So, so spend that time with your family, with your friends, invite somebody over, uh, go home by 10 o'clock at night, but whatever. Um, but spend that time being thankful with your family, your friends. Uh, we won't be here that week, but we will, for those of you watching online, we will have this uploaded for you online as well. So you can, you can take time to watch that or invite people over your place to watch this. Otherwise, join us Sunday, uh, next Sunday, 9 o'clock or 1045 live. That's fine too. Um, but don't, don't we have so much to be thankful for? Anybody else have stuff to be thankful for, right? Like, I am so thankful. We got so much to be thankful for. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my boys. I'm thankful for Pastor John. Anybody else thankful for Pastor John? Yeah. About Justin, Megan, man, I am so thankful. Like I'm just, I'm sitting back there and John scared me because he goes, hey, we're on song two. And I was like, I was, I was worshiping, right? Like I'm in the middle and like I turn over and I'm like, oh man, I didn't know you were so close to me, right? Um, (laughs) But man, we've got so much to be thankful for. These, these two have been so amazing tonight. Uh, but, but man, from everybody on our staff to our church family, man, I'm so thankful. And so I want us to start preparing our minds that way. We should be thankful all year round, but right now it's that reminder of, okay, we, we should be thankful for things. So we should also tell people when we're thankful for them, right? Because we want to encourage people and, and we got to say, man, I'm so thankful for you. 
Like the way that you've spoken into my life. Like I'm so thankful for you. Man, I am so thankful for your voice and the way that you kill this worship set and and every worship set, right? Like we need to do that. Like we need people, right? Like we need to do that with our friends, with our family, with people we run into and just, just encourage people, right? In a world where, where there's, it's so easy to be negative. Let's continue to be loving and and, and tell people that we're thankful for them. Can we do that this week? Okay, awesome. Awesome. And I think that, that the biggest thing that we can be thankful for, right, as a church, as believers, is the fact that God cares about us. And he cares about us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, right? And so we remember that. And we're going to remember that tonight through communion. And if, if you're online joining us, press pause. Go grab communion elements. Otherwise, if you're here in the building, we've got communion elements on the side here. And it's two cups. The bottom cup's bread, the top cup's juice. And when you go and grab those, grab both of them. Grab some for your family. Bring it back. And uh, Justin and Megan are going to do some worship for us right now uh, while we reflect on God's love for us. And we reflect on what Jesus has done for us. And then in the midst of that time of worship, uh, we're going to have you guys lead yourselves, lead your own family in a time of communion and reflecting and go ahead and take communion during this next song. And then we'll just close out when, when everybody looks like they've done that. Does that work? Awesome. Hey, we are so glad you guys are here. You guys can go grab those and we'll keep worshiping together. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you bring your life to me you have been so so
God, we thank you so much for your love. Pour it out for us. God, we thank you that the story doesn't end on that cross, but it ends with a risen, victorious Savior three days later, conquering it all on our behalf. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for loving us at our worst. Let's sing this together. Oh, the other one. to say to those of you at home, uh, I understand sometimes you can't be here with us, but man, it's there's something special happens when we get together and then we have worship like that. Um, it's, it's special. So yeah. So I understand if you need to be home, but man, when you're ready, you need to get here. It's, it's a good thing. Uh, I'll say this. Um, I'm just going to be totally honest with you. There was a stretch there in the month of April where I kind of enjoyed sitting at home doing church with my wife. I had never done that. Like a lot of you do it all the time. You just like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to worship God in the mountains Poof, gone. And I, I can't do that. I'm here all, all every weekend, you know? So I kind of enjoyed doing that, but then I, I was over it real fast. And so was she. It's like, all right, we're ready to be around people. You know, we need to be around people. And uh, so I, this, this kind of moment just reminds me of how significant it is to be around people when we worship. And um, it, it can still happen online, and that has served us really well this year for a lot of reasons. And we love you guys. We're glad you're connected. But, man, as soon as you can get here, get here. We, we need to be together. So I say that to say this. This has been a weird year. I don't need an amen for that. It's just it's been a weird year. How about a right on? Right on. Uh, and we're not even to Thanksgiving yet, but I'm already thinking about Christmas. And I'm thinking, this might be the weirdest Christmas ever. Check, check this out. Look at this picture. I hope that's a typo. But cookies for Satan, seriously, and they're on sale, right? This is going to be a weird Christmas, man. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, if you have missed being with us the last few weeks, we are in this series uh, called Financial Freedom. And just to give you a quick recap, uh, a couple of things we've been talking about the last few weeks. One is, uh, we, we basically said this in week one, it's like the only way out of our financial problems and trouble is to follow what God says, to follow his principles, to follow his wisdom. And so we kind of we really kind of pounded that the first week. And then last week, we really covered a couple things, but one of them would be we, we've got to start by putting God first. I mean, he needs to be first in our life, but that, that then shows up in our finances where we, we give to him first, a reflection of our, of our commitment to him, our, our, 
our gratitude to him, it's, he's got to be first. He can't be any leftover thing. He's got to be first. And then the other thing we said last week is, so we're also going to save. And our first priority was to get a $1,000 emergency fund. And so I've already talked to some people this week that went back home and they're figuring out what they could sell and whatever. They, they, they're working on that. So props to you. I'm glad you're working on that. So those are some of the things we kind of talked about right away. In fact, if you missed last week, I, I do encourage you to go online and, and check out the, the, the ones you missed. Because sometimes I'm looking at this like, there's no way I can cover it all in one week, but there's, there's bits and pieces each week that you kind of need to get the whole picture. And so uh, one of the things that we talked about last week really was God's blessings. And we said, we want to, we want to, we want to protect those blessings. And that was part of the, 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 the savings piece there, the, the $1,000 emergency. We want to protect those blessings because we don't want to go back into debt when an emergency happens. We're trying to get out of debt, and that, that's a big part of this. And we'll talk specifically about the how to get out of part next week. But this week, we're really going to focus on just the idea of compound interest. And I feel like I'm an adjunct professor at Wall Street Journal or something. But I want to explain some stuff that I know is like news to some of you because you never thought about this stuff. You, you go to work, you get your paycheck, you come home, you spend it. You go back to work so you can do it again the next week and, and again and again and again. And you don't understand the, the power and the, the power for good or bad of, of this thing called compound interest. And so I, I want to explain that for you a little bit. But first of all, let me do this. I, I do want to use Wall Street Journal for a moment because, um, you know, when we talk about saving and we talk about letting that compound interest help us, and I'll explain compound interest in a minute, but when we talk about it helping us, we think, Man, we, we live in maybe one of the most abundant countries in the world. And uh, it's not, no, we're not the only one, but like we are one of for sure. And that, man, I, I, bet, I bet America is pretty good at saving. <laughs> you probably know we're not, right? Like I'm hoping we are. But Wall Street Journal came out with a thing by country of who saves the most by average per paycheck. And this really kind of shocked me. So I figured, you know, we got to be in like in the top three, but we weren't number one. Number one was Ireland. 19.3% of every check goes into long-term savings. That, that's the average. Oh, that's crazy. That's amazing. That's crazy. But I thought, okay, well, not number one, but maybe we're number two. Nope, France. France was number two, 16% of every check went into long-term savings. Well, you know, we're not gold, silver, maybe, no, not even bronze. That's Spain, 13%. And we fell way down, by the way. The average American saves about 5%, which based on some of the stuff, I think that's a pretty generous percentage from some of the other stuff I've read. And what does that mean? It means we live in the most abundant economy in the world, and we have the potential, if we're willing to work hard, to do some amazing things and to find this financial dream and chase that American dream. But apparently the American dream really has nothing to do with saving for most people. They just get further and further in debt, further and further in trouble, further and further and deeper and deeper in distress and pressure and all of that stuff. So what is compound interest? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because I want to explain it to you. <laughs> you got some explaining to do if you're old TV, not like me and you're like, I love Lucy. Um, so what is it? Well, let me first of all say this. Albert Einstein is attributed with this quote. This is what he supposedly said. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. And so here's a picture I want you to get. I want you to understand that this is how compound interest works. This is compound interest is that rock and we are in debt. So compound interest, it just gets harder and harder and harder the, the more we go up the hill. Now, if you were to flip that around, rolling a big rock down a hill is easy. Well, that's the good size of compound interest. So here's the idea. Let's say you take $1,000. Some of you are like, I'm working on it, John. Okay, wait, I'm not, I'm not talking about the same emergency fund. I'm just saying, let's just say somebody gave you $1,000 and you invested it in a long-term thing. And let's just be crazy. Let's just say, for round number's sake, we get 10%. Year after year after year. We never add to it, by the way. We just put in $1,000 one time and we get 10% back. So at the end of one year, by the way, for those of you who are math whizzes, help me out here. If you put in $1,000 and you earn 10% over a year, what would that be? You earned $100. So the next year, by the way, you wouldn't earn another $100. You know why? Compound interest. 
So you would have, now you would have $1,100. And so the next year you would earn an extra 1,100. Just so you get the idea. So every year, the, the total that you have gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then this is a cool thing. I did some math and then I realized, I don't know if I'm doing this right. So I actually checked it out on an interest calculator online. And I just did the simple thing I just showed you. If we put $1,000 in, never added to it, in 10 years, at 10% interest, we would have $2,594. That's the good side of compound interest. In other words, your money is working for you. You're not working for Visa or MasterCard or anybody else. And so let me just remind you that in January, we're going to be offering a Financial Peace University. It's a more intensive course than what we're able to do on weekend services. But man, huge, huge help. So when that comes up, if you've never done that, I encourage you to get into that. So for those of you who are note takers, just got three things real simple for you this week, all based on the same idea. But let's dive into this. Number one, we got to stop going into debt. We just got to stop going any further into debt. And like I said, next week, we're going to show you how to get out of that. But debt is the wrong side of compound interest. I'm going to help you guys understand this if you don't know this. Some of you know this and uh, you've done well. So let me just kind of give you a quick picture of Michelle and I in our life. We have never had a credit card um, amount that we didn't pay off every month. Except when we first got married. I had $400 at JCPenney's. I used it to buy a TV and I hadn't paid it off yet. I still had about $400 on there. Okay. So it was pretty fresh. And so she comes into the scene and she's like, well, we're not going to have debt. I'm like, Oh, sounds good to me. So pff, paid it off. That was the last time we carried a balance on a credit card. Because what I'm going to tell you, it, it's just nasty, horrible, treacherous stuff. And some of you maybe don't understand it, but you understand the stress of it because that's where you're at. So let me just kind of help you move from there and encourage you to stop going any further into debt. And we got to start getting out of it. Here's how credit card companies work. So have you heard of this phrase, monthly minimum payment or minimum monthly payment? You know what I'm talking about? So let's say your uh, credit card is, you know, you got $1,500 on there. They're going to tell you your monthly minimum payment is X amount. Now, by the way, when you pay that and you're, you're knocking your principal down a little bit, they literally lower your monthly minimum payment. You're like, I'm making progress. No, they got you just where they want you. They lower the monthly minimum payment because they want you to stay in debt. Okay, so you tracking with me? Some of you are like, I, I thought I came to church. Now I feel like I'm at the Wall Street Journal Conference Center. You know, no, hang in there because this is actually what we said in week one is our money stuff is a spiritual thing. And so I want you to understand the trap that is there. So in week one, I gave you some statistics. You know, the most the average American household has seven to eight thousand plus in credit card debt. The average averages in the people who have no credit card debt, like Michelle and I. So we help the average come down. Here's the really bad news. The average person in America who has a, you know, any kind of credit that they roll over to the next month, their average is $16,000. So the average person who's carrying a debt on their credit card is $16,000. And a lot of credit cards are going to charge anywhere from 15 to 22%. Every now and then you'll find them less than that. And that's just to get you started. And then before you know it, it pops up to 21%. So I'm going to do a, another math thing with you. some of you are like, I don't like math. I don't like it. I know you don't. That's why I'm having to explain it like this. So let me do this this way. All right. Let's say you have $15,000 on a card. So I'm being nice. If the average card holder who carries, you know, uh, any kind of debt on there has 60, let's just make it 15. And let's use the lower end of the spectrum. Let's say your credit card has a 15% Compounding interest, you don't want to be on this side of it, but it's 15%. So $15,000, 15%, your, your monthly minimum payment, you're, you're going to make it every month, every month, every month, which is based on 2%, by the way. So it's like, it's, it's not a big amount. Anybody want to take a shot at how many years it's going to take to pay off $15,000 with a monthly minimum payment? Just shot in the dark. Anybody? 33 years, way too low. It's over 40. It's over 40 years. Okay, let me be specific. 44 years. 
It can take you 44 years to pay off $15,000 with a minimum monthly payment when the interest rate is, is 15%. And a lot of them are higher than that. And, and here's the horrible news. Okay, that's bad enough. So you're in debt for 44 years. You're, you're under this for 44 years. On top of that, the interest you paid on $15,000 is $40,000. So you pay $55,000 over the long haul. I just did the math wrong there. Let me look at this. 15,040. Yeah, that's 55,000. That scared me just to say it out loud. I mean, that's how bad it is, right? So you pay an additional $40,000 over those 44 years. I got a verse for you. Some of you are like, finally, the Bible. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Listen to this carefully. Let no debt remain outstanding. If it takes you 44 years, yeah, you should pay it off. Because as Christ followers, that's what we're called to do. We're called to pay off the debt. Listen to what it says. Though. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The only debt we're really allowed to carry as Christ followers is this debt to love other people because Christ loved us first. So we've got to stop going into debt. If you're in debt, and you're $15,000 in debt, and you're making minimum monthly payments, it's going to take you a long time, but, but make the payments and get out. But could I encourage you, get out sooner. I'm going to show you how next week, but it's like you're going to have to make more than just a minimum monthly payment, and you're going to have to be brutal about it, and you're going to have to work at it, but it can be done. In fact, let me, let me show you the number one financial tool. I, I truly believe that. This is the number one financial tool and it literally saves you thousands of dollars, and it only costs you about $4. Is it, would anybody like to know the financial tool that I'm talking? One person, thank you very much. You're right. This right here could save you thousands of dollars. I just found this, and somebody wasn't looking in their purse, and I took it. No, I'm kidding. Mm. this little tool right here, man, it can save you a whole bunch of money. If you're in debt now, don't go in any further. Stop. Do you guys remember that, that one infomercial? Stop the insanity. Yeah, that, that's what we're talking about here. Just, just stop. You know being on the wrong side of compound, compound interest is horrible. Maybe you are there. Maybe you feel trapped. Maybe you feel like, I'm so glad you're talking about it because it makes me feel even worse. Maybe that's where you're at. Man, don't give up. You can get to freedom. You can. It's going to take work, but you can get there. And one of the things I want to really encourage you to do, remember, let me pick this up. I can, I can put this back together and use it again. <laughs> I'll tape it back up for Sunday services. I only have one card I could cut up. So, all right. Uh, I mentioned it every week during this series. We are entering into the most dangerous season of the year for you if you're a debt person, and it's Christmas, and we justify it. Well, I know I'm in debt, but man, it's Christmas. So if we go a little further in debt, it's not going to be a big problem. We're already $15,000 in debt. What if we just do like $1,000? We're only $16,000. Man, do your life and your family a favor and don't go any further into debt. Just agree. Like, this is all we can spend, and that's all we're going to spend. And if you have extended family who don't understand, tell them that the governor doesn't want them over at your house for Christmas. <laughs> don't tell them the pastor said They Just tell them the governor said that, right? I've never been able to use it like that, but I can now. Proverbs 22, verse 7, listen to this. The borrower is slave to the lender borrower is slave to the lender. That's the wisdom of God when it comes to this. He doesn't want you to be a slave. He wants you to be free, free to love him, free to follow him. I talked to somebody one time who felt true, honest, godly conviction in a message about going on a missions trip with our church. And they said, but I can't do it. I'm like, why not? Because I'm so far into debt. Their debt, they had become a slave to MasterCard, and they weren't free to do what God was li literally telling them to do. That, that's the position they found themselves in. So don't go any further into debt. Even with Christmas on the horizon, just be super you know, frugal and careful and, and watch all that. You know, maybe fast forward 40 years. 
for some of us, we'll be dead. <laughs> so maybe that's a bad illustration for some of you, right? I'll be dead in 40. I know that. In fact, people will say, well, you're middle-aged. No, I'm way past middle-aged because I don't plan on being over 100 and I'm over 50. So I'm past middle-aged. So whatever you are, so just fast forward several years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. Who are you a slave to? I, I, I want to be a slave to Jesus. Period. So don't go any further into debt. Number two, if we really want to compound the blessings, be on the right side of all this, don't worry about the future. Pray and plan. Don't worry about the future, but pray and plan. By the way, did you know in the Bible that worry is a sin? That's why good Christians don't use the word worry. We use the word concerned. Oh, I'm not worried. I'm just concerned. Oh, that's worry, right? It's just a different way to say the same thing. And worry simply means this, that I'm not sure I can trust God. That's why I'm worried about it. You don't think I'm telling you the truth? Listen, these are the words of Jesus, Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not, what's the word? Worry, do not worry about your life what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you're going to wear. A lot of people interpret verses like this to mean you don't have to save. <laughs> it's a pretty twisted way to look at the Bible, but they say, hey, don't worry about your life. So you don't have to save. God's going to just take care of everything. No, he, what he literally means is this. Are you ready? Do not worry. He didn't say do not save. He says do not worry. And by the way, if we save because we're worried, we're saving for the wrong reasons. If I'm saving because I believe that God loves me and cares for me, knows what he's talking about, I'm just going to follow him, then I'm saving for the right reasons. And so this, this prayer and plan thing begins to come together. And we're going to just continue to talk about saving throughout this series too. We need to get out of debt, but we need to continue to save. I'm going to come back to that again. But number three, I'm going to compound our blessings. We've got to understand how God blesses. Some of you who, who watch your watches, or watch the clock, you're like, what? we're already on three. We're good. No, <laughs> we're ready to camp out right here for a while. So don't get all antsy on me, right? In the Lord's prayer, Jesus said, give us this day our daily what? Okay, our daily bread, our daily bread, our daily bread. And because of that line, again, some people think, we're supposed to eat all the bread every day. Give us today our daily bread so we can eat it all up, right? So I don't know if you're an Old Testament fan or if you know the story of the Israelites. They wandered around for 40 years. And the entire time, the Bible says their clothes never wore out. It was, it was horrible on the fashion industry. Anyway, so their clothes never wore out. <laughs> their sandals never wore out. And I'm really weak on my jokes this, this week. I know I am. But God also provided for them food every day. It was called manna. You know, literally, the, the actual translation for that word manna is like, what is it? That, that's what the word means. I don't know. What is it? Well, God brought it down like in the dew in the morning and there it was. And they would pick it up off the ground and then they could bake it. They could make it. I remember um, a song by a Christian artist named Keith Green, who was tragically killed in uh, an airplane accident. But when I was like in high school, I mean, this guy was not just a great artist, but he was a very convicting kind of a, a writer. And uh, he had one just kind of fun song about uh, the Israelites and manna. And he started listing out all the things they made with it. Like one of them was banana bread. Anyway, so I, I'm sure they had manna tacos. I don't know what all they had, but they had manna every single day. And God put it there for them every day, except for one day, Saturday. That was their Sabbath. They weren't supposed to work at all. And so God would send them some extra on Friday, and they were supposed to pick up enough for two days for Friday and Saturday. So they got, they got their food, but they had to have some for the next day. Okay, you tracking with me? All right, so just because God says pray for our daily bread doesn't mean we have to eat all the bread every day. And maybe a better picture of all of what I'm trying to say is in Proverbs chapter 6. And it's by these little tiny things that I don't actually like. They're called ants. Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 6, says, Go to the ant, 
you sluggard. <laughs> By the way, the Bible doesn't pull punches sometimes. He sometimes calls them fools. Sometimes he calls them lazy. And here he calls them a sluggard. He says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So it doesn't eat all of its food, but it stores some of it. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? <laughs> When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. There's a couple things we notice from these verses. Pretty powerful picture. Number one, ants are smarter than a lot of people. A lot of people, if you remember what we talked about last week, we spend it as fast as we get it. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That means almost eight out of 10 Americans are literally eating all their bread every week. Also says we're supposed to work hard. So, so God's blessing doesn't mean that I don't have to do anything. I just pray and God like manna plops it into my life. It's like I'm supposed to work hard. The ants, they're working hard. The opposite of the ant is the sluggard, the lazy bum who's not doing anything, right? And then... When we harvest, we're supposed to put some back for the future. All of this we get out of these little verses about these little things called ants. You say, yeah, but we're not farmers. We don't have a harvest time. Let me tell you what the equivalent to your harvest time is. Payday. When payday comes, that's harvest. You worked and you got a paycheck. So when you get a paycheck, what are we talking about? You put God first. But the second thing you got to do is you got to put some aside. You don't eat all your bread. So let me give you another picture of this. So we, we've talked about the 10, 10, 80 plan before. The first 10% I give to God, second 10%, I need to save for long term. And then I have 80% left over. So I'm going to come back to that, but I want you to keep that picture in mind. So let's say that God is like, like, a, like a dad with, with some teenagers. And so let's say I'm the dad and let's say I have teenagers. And I give my teenagers some money for lunch. And I, and I give them enough money for lunch all week at school. So at the beginning of the week on Monday, I give them enough money for lunch all week. But on the way to school, they stopped by and got a breakfast burrito. And so then they had lunch for a couple of days. And then they had to run out of lunch because they got a breakfast burrito that kind of got into their lunch money. And so then on Thursday and Friday, they didn't have enough money for food those days for lunch. And so they come home and they're like, Dad, don't, don't you love us? Don't you care? Like we're literally the only ones at school sitting there without anything to eat. Well, I, I gave you enough money. I know, I know, but I got this breakfast burrito anyway. Okay, so a loving dad gives them just a little bit more to cover that, make sure it lasts the whole week, and they get two breakfast burritos. Now, now they run out of money on Tuesday afternoon. Like they don't have enough for Wednesday or Thursday. Or don't you love us? Don't you care about us? Don't you know what you're doing to us? You know how embarrassing it is when I go to school and all the kids have lunch and I don't have lunch? Okay, well, let's see if I can give you a little bit more. And so it gives them a little bit more. Guess what they do? They buy three breakfast burritos on Monday. They have lunch on Monday and then that's it. They're out of money. It's like no money. But what do we say? God, I thought you loved me. He goes, well, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, I got this, this breakfast burrito car. And then I got a breakfast burrito cable package. And then I got a breakfast burrito vacation. And it's more than I had, so I just kept using what you gave me for my provision, but I used it for other things. And then we keep going back to God, like, God, don't you, don't you love me? Don't you care? Because of course I love you. In fact, I love you so much, I'm going to start giving you even less until you figure this out. That's what a good parent does. We were teaching this to our kids when they were younger. And I've told this story before, but when our girls were younger, we, we, we realized that it was like the bank of John. You know, when your kids start getting into like middle school, it's like there's a, there's everything needs money, you know? So it's like, like this arm was so much bigger than this arm because this is my money was in my right pockets. So Michelle and I talked about it. I said, you know what? Why don't we use this as a way to teach them? So we started giving our girls $50 a month. And we just said, this covers lunches at school. This covers going to a movie with your friends. This covers anything you want to do on your own. Now, if you go to a movie with us, we pay for it. It's so cool. They wanted to spend so much time with us. I gave them 50 bucks. Last the whole month. My youngest ran out of hers in one week. 
came back to me, dad, I'm already out of money. I said, tough, because I loved her, because I loved her. So three weeks go by with her going, that's pretty much the face that I saw for three weeks. Next month, so here's 50 bucks. It's going to last the whole month. She made it two weeks. Dad, I'm out of money. Tough. (laughs) This hand is not coming out anymore the rest of the month, so just forget it. You mean I have to make my own lunch and take it to school? Yep. Because that's what we told him. It's like the food is right here. If you want to make your own lunch, you could save that money and use it for something else too. You don't have to buy a lunch. We've got food right here. You could do that too. So third month, she made it the whole way. It's the last time we had to have the conversation. I wonder if God says to some of us, you know what? I've given you enough. I'm not going to bail you out again. Why? Because I love you. I want better for you. Listen to this in Matthew 25, 27. Jesus is actually given a picture here. And it's not really about finances, but he uses finances to make his point. But in the middle of this, he says this. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Anybody remember the story? It's called the story of the talents. So it's not talking about abilities. Talents is an amount of money. So he gives one guy 10, gives one guy five, gives one guy one. The guy with 10 doubles it. The guy with five doubles it. The guy with one buries it, doesn't do anything with it. And so literally in this story, it's not, it's not God in the story. It's like this guy who's just this mean ruler. And he's like, well, at least you should have done is put it and give me back with interest. Like that's, that's, just, that's, that's the bare minimum, he says. And I wonder if somehow we can learn from that even. And just like, you know what? Maybe, maybe I need to make sure that I am saving money so I can be on the right side of compound interest. Because the minimum I should be doing is getting some, some kind of interest for this stuff. So how are we doing? Well, let me give you some more stats. About 30% of people in America have zero in savings. Zero. I don't know if you're good at math. Hmm, That's not very much, all right? Zero. Another 30% have less than $1,000. So we talked about that $1,000 emergency fund. Based on this, 60% of people in America aren't even to that, let alone any other kind of savings. They don't even have anything more than $1,000. 15% have between $1,000 and $5,000, which means 75% of Americans have less than $5,000 in savings. Total, total. Which means... Even the ants are smarter than most of us. That's what it means. Even the ants know you got to put something back for the future. So, so does this work? According to the Bible, it does. Listen to this one. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now, some people think, well, we got to wait until everything's paid back. And then maybe, maybe then we have some leftover and then we can start into savings. Like, no, just start now. Start doing something now. Start putting something into savings now. It's like, I'm not going to make God be waiting for my leftovers. I'm not going to let my saving be let, waiting for my leftovers. I need to do this now. So let's go back to that 10, 10, 80 thing. I'm going to get my harvest. I'm going to get my paycheck. I'm going to say, God, you're first. You're number one in my life. I'm going to show that to you this way. And then I'm going to start putting money into savings. And now I do need to deal with with like long-term savings. And I got to get out of debt at the same time. So you know what some of you are going to have to do? I know this is just going to sound like crazy talk. Like this guy has lost his mind. Here, are you ready for this? You have to stop buying stuff. Don't go on the trip you really hoped you would do right now. You're going to have to cut some things. You're going to have to say no to some stuff so that you can do what you need to do in order to get to a place of freedom. And I know that as soon as you do it and you see it, you're going to go, this is awesome. I've, I've talked to people who have, who have had these stories where they, they were trapped. They were under that rock. The compound interest was on the wrong side. They just get further and further and further. And then they, they turned everything around and they were like diligent and they worked at it and they, they, they got to this place where they found freedom and they got rid of the debt. It's like, woo! Some of you are hearing this, you're like, yeah, it, that might be possible for some people. I, I don't even know if I could ever do it. You can. You can. 
And in the midst of this, let me tell you one more thing you need to spend your money on. So we got 10 and 10 and 80. We're, we're living on 80%. By the way, it's called margin. That, that's a good thing. So we're only living on 80% of it. But even with the 80%, you know what? That all belongs to God too. It does. So let me encourage you with one little thing you can do. And it can be little, but it makes a huge difference. With the 80%, plan on being generous to some other people in the midst of it. You're like, dude, you are smoking crack. I'm already in trouble. I'm not giving anything to God. I'm not giving anything to savings. I'm deeply in debt. I, I, want, to, I want to do everything you're saying. How in the world am I going to do that? And then you say, and be generous to other people. I'm talking like $5. $2, $5 a month, whatever it is, but just figure out a way to do something for somebody else. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible says so. That should be good enough. But I'm going to give you this really cool thing that some people did to show you how this works. So let me read some of this. There's kind of this counterintuitive thing that Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton did. Now, Dunn is a professor at University of British Columbia and, uh, Norton is at Harvard, and together they published this book. Here's the name of the book, Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. And what they did was they actually did these surveys and they did these studies where they try to figure out what made people happy when they spent money. And they discovered that no matter the amount, the more people spent, whatever the amount, if they spent it on themselves, it didn't necessarily make them happier. If they spent something on somebody else, even if it was little, they were happier. You say, how do you, how do you quantify that? <laughs> Power word for the day. I just threw that in there. Uh, so here, here's what they did. Here's a couple of things they did. They followed a specific group of people who were given bonuses. So they just, this is not like a, a controlled study. They just followed these people around and they watched them and they did some interviews. And those who used at least some of the money from their generosity to maybe help somebody else, they discovered that they were happier than those who just spent it all on themselves. They were happier. Then they chased down this theory with a controlled test, and they conducted an experiment with students from the University of British Columbia. Students were first asked questions about, about how happy they were, and then they were given money. They were given money. It wasn't even theirs to start. They were just given money, and they said, you need to spend it on yourself or somebody else by 5 o'clock that same day. The ones who spent the money on themselves were about the same amount of happy as they were earlier in the day. But those who spent some of it on somebody else, and really they go on to say it had nothing to do with the amount. It could have been as little as $5. They literally were generous to somebody else and they were happier. And they, they, could, they could measure that. And I'm, I'm reading this. A friend of mine sent it to me. I'm reading this and I'm like, I've heard this before. Acts 20, 35 where they are quoting Jesus saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I know if you want to sound more spiritual, they were more blessed, whatever. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So even while you're working your plan, maybe set aside five bucks and just go get a, a gift card for five bucks and then just watch for somebody that week and say, who, who needs them encouragement? Who needs, and get, I'm going to tell you, man, it's going to give, give fuel to your soul. Because the Bible says you're going to be more blessed because you're being more generous. Here's the cool thing. As you work the plan, as you get out of debt, as you get some savings in there, you're giving to God the whole time. As all this is happening, your, your ability to give even more is going to grow. So there, there may be a point in your budget where you're like, you know what? $100 a week. We're just going to give it away. Keep our eyes open, pray $100 a week. You may get to the point where it's $300. I, I don't know. But I just know if you just start with $5, just making sure that somebody else has been encouraged and you're being generous. I know you're going to be happier. They're going to be blessed. And God is going to use that like fuel for your soul. Now, I want to, I want to pivot and wrap this up. I don't want to leave the subject totally, but I want to show you the connection here in a minute. But let me say this first. We are just uh, a week away, a few days away uh, from Thanksgiving. And I am thankful for a lot of things. And maybe... This has been a weird year, like we're giving cookies to Satan or whatever. It's like a weird year. But even in the midst of this year, haven't you been able to see, hey, but, th but that's good. And God's doing this. And I'm, I'm blessed this way. It's like there, there's a list of things we can be thankful for. And I, and I was just kind of hit with this this morning early. 
uh, on Thursdays, I get together with uh, some of the area pastors. And this particular month, we, we move around every month. This month, it has been at community. And so in one of our side rooms, right behind that wall, one of those side rooms right there, was some pastors this morning where we were reading through the book of Titus. We did a chapter each week. We were in chapter three this week. We had communion together. We prayed together. But there was this one part of what we were reading that just like, every time I read it, it gets me. But I was, I was reading it and listening to other guys read it while I was being thankful for the fact that while I serve at a church that I absolutely love and so proud of to be a part of, I'm, I'm part of something bigger than just us. There's other churches in this valley and we're all in on this together. And so we pray for each other. And we love each other. We care about each other. I'm, I'm thankful for those relationships. So I give you that as a backdrop. But here's the passage I want you to hear. Titus 3, beginning in verse 4. It says, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing, rebirth, and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, that means just as if I'd never sinned, he wipes the slate clean, justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And right before verse four, the reason he says, but, he says, there's a whole bunch of people out there fighting and hating. I don't know if you noticed that this year in 2020. There's a lot of people, it just seems like on opposite sides of just about everything. And it seems like the gap gets bigger and bigger. And he says, but, in other words, you don't be like that. That's, that's what's going on there. But you, and it's based on being grateful and thankful for what Christ has done for us. He says, it's because, not, not because of righteous stuff we've done. We haven't earned this, but God gave it to us. And because of that, it should transform the way we do life. And that includes, by the way, the way we handle our finances. It includes the way we parent our kids. It includes the way that we do business with other people. It includes everything. One of my favorite quotes of the year came out of the mouth of somebody that uh, I've grown to know this year and really appreciate. And she said this, she said, 2020, it's the year nobody wants to talk about, but it's the year God saved my life. I'll never forget those words. Because in the midst of what has been awkward and difficult for a lot of people, God has been moving in people's lives and we could be thankful for that grateful for that. And maybe you sit around a table next week and you got some family with you or some friends. I hope you take some time just to express some of those things you're grateful for, even in 2020. But, but let our gratitude, let our thanksgiving for the generosity of God and his grace help transform the way we see the stuff that we get to use while we're here on planet earth, this stuff called money. It's, just, it's temporary, but man, we can use it in a way that makes a difference for eternity. And maybe we can use it in a way that helps the next person say, this was the year God changed my life. God saved my life. Because God's trying to do that for people. And he wants us, he wants us to take that message to them. Let's pray. God, we love you. We are grateful. And, and sometimes we find ourselves just completely trapped financially, in debt, on the wrong side of the compound interest. And God, for anybody who's listening to this, who is in that place, I pray, God, you would help them see that there is a way out and they can get there. But God, for all of us, let us just be thankful again for your generous gift of grace. You're wiping the slate clean. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I went over. You're done. Ice cream's outside. Love you. <laughs>